Uh, my name is Jason Collins, uh, and I'm here today to talk about bats. Bats are experiencing some tough times lately. Uh, the disease white nose syndrome and other factors have caused many species of bats to decline precipitously. While these declines have been well reported and studied in the bat research community, the topic isn't often discussed outside of what you might call the bat cave. Um, I was telling some people earlier, but those of you who filtered in late, uh, this is just a picture of me doing what I do. So that's a mist net stretched across the pond. Uh, you can see some bags there that are hanging in the mist net, and I'm pulling a bat out. Um, so bats are often associated with water. Uh, we catch them a lot over water. Um, they like to drink out of the ponds. They uh, feed on aquatic insects, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more specifically about that. So as an environmental consultant, it is my duty to use the best available science to help my clients ensure that they are adhering to regulatory um, uh, policies um, in protecting species. Um, so I help them come up with pragmatic and practical solutions that both regulatory agencies and project proponents can agree upon. Um, and the Watershed Congress has much the same goal. So I pulled this quote from the Watershed Congress website, and I believe it's reflective of what I'm trying to accomplish. So during our time this afternoon, I'll, we'll take you through some of the science about bats in their declines, particularly here in Pennsylvania. And we will talk about sort of the, the issues, some of the regulatory issues dealing with these species, and we will sum up with some practical applications of what we can do to help bats um, with their current state. So bats have an amazing diversity. There are over 1,300 species of bats found in the world, and they're the only true flying mammal. And their mechanism of flight is completely different than that of birds. So you can see here in the diagram that the bat wing is composed of bones mostly made up of the hand. So if you're sort of to take your hand and do this with it, their thumb is right here where it normally would be and their fingers are elongated. These two fingers are joined and the majority of their wing is right here between these two fingers. A bird is much different where it uses the majority of their forearm. Um, and so that the, the evolution of the flight mechanism is completely separated between birds and bats. Bats are, um, bats in the new world, so the bats that we have here are in the order um, Microchiroptera, or the microbats, and they possess the ability to echolocate. Um, and they use this to forage for food, um, to navigate, and to communicate. Bats are globally distributed with the exception of Arctic regions. Uh, and one out of every sp four species of mammals on Earth is a bat. Only the order of rodents are more speciose than bats. Bats have an incredible array of adaptations from roosting in large spider webs to feeding on fish um, and even blood. They have an incredibly long lifespan given their small size. So tr traditionally we think of this as rats versus elephants. Rats are very small, they live very short um, lifespans. Elephants are very large, it takes lots of energy for them to you know, reach reproductive size, so they tend to, to live very long lives. Well, bats are very small, but they have very long lifespans, up to about 25 years in the wild. Um, and this is probably because they sleep most of their lives. <laughs> <laughs> so a bat sleeps probably about 80% of his life, um, and it's a really good sleep. They can lower their heartbeat down to one beat per minute when they're in hi hibernation. So that, I wish I could get that good of sleep. <laughs> All of our bats here in Pennsylvania are members of the Vesper bat family. Um, and they exclusively feed on nocturnal insects. Uh, these are traditionally uh, flying insects. However, some species are gleaners, which means they'll pick insects off of leaves as they fly through the forest. Like all macro, uh, micro bats, they use echolocation to forage, to communicate, and to navigate um, through dark environments. And this unique adaptation has allowed them to exploit a unique niche, and that's caves and mines. And so some of our bats, known as the cave bats, use caves and mines to hibernate uh, during the wintertime. Um, 
This is different than the tree bats, which actually migrate instead of hibernating. So they'll go from areas in the northern United States and Canada, and they'll migrate all the way down to the southern United States and down into Mexico. So the first of our bats uh, in Pennsylvania is the little brown bat. Um, this is Myotis lucificus, and Myotis means mouse-eared. So bats are often sort of associated with mice because they kind of look a little bit similar, but they're totally not related. Bats are more closely related to humans than they are to, to rodents. Um, but their ears look a little similar, so they call them the mouse-eared bats. Um, this was once the most common bat in Pennsylvania. However, due to white-nose syndrome, which we will expound upon later, they have been extirpated from a large portion of the state. Little brown bats are particularly fond of ponds and rivers and streams where they use um, to forage uh, for insects. They like very large snags and trees with exfoliating bark. They roost in cavities and then under the exfoliating bark. So shagbark hickory is a really good habitat um, for these bats. And then they use caves and abandoned mines in the wintertime for hi uh, hibernation. The next bat is the northern long-eared bat, Myotis septentrionalis. Um, and it's named uh, septentrionalis because of its tragus, which is this portion of your ear. It's shaped like a spear. It's really pointy. And that's sort of the unique identifying characteristic of this bat. Mm. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, this bat is unique in that it prefers dense woodland interiors. So most bats don't like a whole lot of clutter to fly around. These bats have, are really uniquely adapted to cluttered environments. So they're very small, they're very maneuverable, they can move around trees and leaves that are in their way very easily. Um, it's likely that that sharp pointed tragus aids in their echolocation, um, allows them to better detect things in their way um, and, and maneuver around it. Um, and their wintertime habitat is not really well understood. So we do surveys in the, in the hibernacula, um, and that's really our best method of gaining an understanding of populations of bats because they're congregated in one area. And the numbers of northerns aren't reflective in these wintertime surveys in the same proportion that the summertime surveys show. So we're a little perplexed on where these bats are going. Um, it's likely that they're going in maybe harder to reach areas of the caves and mines that are difficult for surveyors to reach. So, you know, a bat can fly through a hole this big. I'm not fitting through a hole this big. Um, <laughs> they will maybe are using smaller caves and mines that we just don't survey. Um, we're just not entirely sure what these bats are doing in the, in the winter time. Um, they, um, like I said, they, they really like, the unique thing is they really like the dense forest interior, um, and that's sort of what sets them apart from the other bats. So the small-footed bat, uh, Myotis uh, libii, is unique in its exploitation of rocky habitat. And so this can be talus slopes, which if you've ever been to the northeast Pennsylvania and looked up on the hillside and see big areas of exposed rock, slips over from glaciation, those are talus slopes. Um, any really... Anywhere really where you'll find rattlesnakes, these guys will be um, quarries, mines. Um, they love active mines. I mean, they really, you'll find them around active mines where they'll take the spoilage piles and just push them off to the side. They love those spoilage piles. Um, I've captured, or I've tracked one of these bats back to about 10 feet from I-81 in Pottsville. Um, so it's a highway cut and really any rock that they can squeeze into that provides adequate um, temperature and protection from predators, um, they'll inhabit that. In the wintertime, they really are fond of abandoned mines. Uh, so you find a lot of these bats, really in this watershed, you find a lot of these bats because you have the anthracite regions with a lot of abandoned mines. Um, so they're really unique in that most bats are associated with trees, and these bats really aren't associated with trees. They really like that rocky habitat that's not traditionally associated as bat habitat. So big brown bats, Astipsicus fuscus, are considered to be habitat generalist. Um, and so if someone tells me they have a bat in their house, this is almost certainly the species. Um, they, they do really, really well in the urban interface. Um, there are probably tons of big brown bats around here during the summertime. And actually, it's warm enough now. They might be out now. 
Um, so if you know you see a bat flying around on the evening while you're walking your dog and you live in a neighborhood, it's probably one of these guys. Um, they have extremely powerful jaws. They're beetle specialists, so they their jaws allow them to crunch through that hard exoskeleton of beetles. Um, and so they're uh, they're kind of fun to handle. They're the ones that hurt the most when you get bit by them. <laughs> so you try to avoid that. The tr this is the tricolor bat, or Perimyotis subflavus, and it's named tricolor bat because its fur has this unique tricolor banding around it, which gives it this really beautiful orange blonde color. Um, it's, I wish the picture was coming out a little bit better, but they're kind of like this really nice color. It's, they're, they're really pretty bats. Um, they're also really, really small. It's um, our smallest bat. Um, this bat weighs about as much as two pennies, maybe a penny and a half. Um, <laughs> so very, very small. People talk all the time about how light birds are and all the adaptations that birds have to make them light. Well, bats weigh less than birds and they don't have any of those adaptations, so it's pretty amazing. These bats aren't really well understood as far as their habitat preferences. Um, it's not an endangered species, so there's not been a whole lot of research on it. Um, and their, for their winter habitat, it's likely that they actually do longer range migrations than their cave bat cousins. Um, and it might be because they prefer colder cave environments. So they're traveling longer distances to you know, go up north where it's colder, um, where there's a longer hibernation season. Um, but we're, we're still not really sure what these guys are doing in the wintertime. There's a lot to be, to be learned about this species. So this is the Indiana bat. Um, this is Myotis sedalis. We know probably more about this bat than any other bat because it was listed in 1967 under the predecessor of the Endangered Species Act of 1973. So it's been really well studied. It's known as the social bat because it will form very large um, congregations in the wintertime, very large um, colonies of hundreds of thousands and potentially historically millions in a colony. Um, and this makes it extremely sensitive to, to disruption in the hibernacula. So, you know, if you go in and disturb one hibernacula, you're taking out potentially a very significant portion of the, the species. And so this really had some big impacts um, in the 40s and then the 50s. There were lots of big uh, disturbances, people shutting up mines and destroying caves. Um, Spelunkers going into caves with groups of 20 or 30 three times a year. That's a big impact to a bat that's trying to hibernate. Um, and this really had a big impact on the, on the um, Indiana bats. So this bat really prefers woody vegetation within 30 meters of a stream or a river. Um, they're highly associated with riparian areas. Uh, and that's likely due to their, their prey preference. Uh, you know, they really like aquatic insects. Um, their maternity colonies are most often associated with these bottomland riparian areas. Um, and they tend to roost in very large snags. Um, they're considered pretty closely related to the little brown bat, so a lot of their preferences are very similar. Um, very large trees with cavities um, and exfoliating bark, like shagbark hickory. That is a band, yeah. So that's a, uh, a metal band, um, very similar to bird bands. Um, they're slightly different because they, the bird, they actually used bird bands before they developed the bat bands, but they tend to cut into the wing. The wing membrane is very, very thin. Um, so they're flared out in such a way that it just pinches on there and it won't, it won't impact them. We use them for mark recapture kind of studies. Um, so they, there's been some really interesting uh, results They've just found a bat that was, oh, I think it was like 32 years old or something like that. It was banded like 32 years ago. Um, we've found most of our migratory information comes from band um, data. So someone bans it in the summertime and they find it in a cave um, somewhere else. Um, so there's been some long distant band recoveries, um, you know, hundreds and thousands of miles. Um, but unfortunately, with bats, um, it takes such an effort. I mean, there are hundreds of thousands of bands out there, and our band recoveries are, I think, less than 1%. Um, very, very low band recoveries. But yep, that's a band. <coughs> 
So this is the first of the tree bats. This is Lazarus borealis, or the red bat. Um, pretty obviously why he's called the red bat. Um, they're, they're really strikingly red. Uh, and this is actually the only sexually dimorphic um, species, meaning the males look different than the females. So the females tend to have a little different coloration. They tend to be a little darker um, than the males. But it's the only species that you can tell by looking at them if it's a male or a female without investigating further. <clears throat> um, this species prefers open areas with sparse vegetation. Um, and this is likely a result of their wing morphology. So they tend to have very high aspect ratios, meaning they have long, narrow wings. And this aids in their uh, migration. So the, the high aspect ratio allows for very efficient flight, very fast flight, but it comes at the cost of maneuverability. Uh, so they like to, to fly really fast in a straight distance. They don't like to move, maneuver around things. So you'll find these guys in, in um, pipeline corridors and, and you know, other corridors where it's really easy them, for them to fly back and forth without too much hassle. The unique thing about these guys is that they make the, the long migration down to the southern United States, where they actually roost in Spanish moss in the, in the wintertime. And so you can see how their coloration kind of would allow them to blend into the Spanish moss a little bit. These bats do the same thing. This is uh, the hoary bat, or Lazarus cinereus. This is the largest bat that we have in Pennsylvania. Um, it's about, its body is about that big, if you were to hold it in your hand. And their coloration and their sort of mantic hissing when you're handling them make them really impressive. They're really strong bats. Um, you'll take it, we, we hold them in these little paper bags, uh, just the paper sandwich bags. And if you have it sitting on your, your desk, it'll hop off the desk just for the bat trying to get out. <laughs> um, they're really amazing. And surprisingly, it actually doesn't hurt as bad to get bit by these as it does the big browns. Um, and that's probably because they feed on moths. So they don't really need the, the jaw power. Um, then, you know, moths are pretty soft bodied. And uh, yeah, they, they really don't hurt that bad when you get bit. Um, so they often are found um, along ridge lines. They use them as migration corridors um, and foraging corridors. Um, so they aren't super associated with riparian areas like some of our other bats. Um, but there's sort of a, a niche partitioning here among these species. You notice we're sort of covering all of our bases. Um, and these bats don't really want to interact with each other um, on an interspecific level. So they sort of break up into their niches. So these guys like the forested ridgetops. Um, and they individual bats have been, we believe individual bats will make um, migrations of up to 1,200 miles in one direction every year. So it's really difficult to track an individual bat that far. Um, and that's based off of stable isotope analysis of the hair. So basically, you can look at um, the isotopes of different elements based on a latitudinal gradient. And so doing those studies, they've estimated that the, the average migration is about 1,200 miles for these species. So the silvered-haired bats are probably the least understood species in Pennsylvania. Um, especially for the females, where we have very, very few summer records um, really anywhere, not just in Pennsylvania. We don't know where the females go in the summertime. Um, out of hundreds and hundreds of captures on this one study that I, I uh, did, we had one female um, silver hair bat over like 10 years uh, in West Virginia. Um, so we just really don't know where these guys go. It's probably into really remote areas of northern Canada. They're probably going up really high where there's just not a whole lot of surveyors, you know, going. Um, and then they're going back down to the southern United States uh, in the, in the wintertime. Um, like most tree bats, these bats uh, forage along ridge lines. Um, and they roost on, in cavities and then on the exterior bark um, of trees. So if you see a bat hanging on the, the outside of a tree, just on the bark, or hanging in the leaves, it's almost certainly a tree bat. Um, the cave bats tend to go into the cavities and under, they tend to hide. These guys will be a little bit more exposed and out in the open. And then there's this guy. <laughs> So this is the evening bat. Um, and it's not traditionally found or associated with Pennsylvania. However, in the past two years, there's been at least four records that I know of, including reproductive females. 
Um, so it might be an instance of a range expansion. There's less bats on the landscape now. Maybe it provides another opportunity for another species to come in, um, but we're not really sure. Uh, so potentially this will get added to the list of bats in Pennsylvania. Um, so that's pretty interesting. So in the winter of 2006, bat biologists in New York made an unfortunate discovery. They found thousands of bats dead outside of a major hibernacula. And these bats were covered in this fungus on their nose and on their wing membranes. It was later determined that this fungus was Pseudogenascus destructans and was likely imported from Europe by cavers or spelunkers um, that failed to adequately sanitize their, their gear. They probably didn't even try to sanitize their gear. Um, and it's had far-reaching implications. Um, we're not really sure actually how the fungus is killing the bats. There's a couple different theories. The most prominent theory is that it's disrupting their hibernation, um, making them wake up, use energy that they would otherwise not be using if they were in hibernation. They go out to find food. There's no insects because it's in the middle of the winter, um, and they starve to death. However, the problem with this theory is that we're finding significant portions of body fat reserves still on the dead bats. So it's, it's a little bit of a mystery. Um, another of the theory is that the mycelia of the fungus, sort of like the fingers that go out of the fungus, are causing an increased surface area, which is causing a lot of water loss, and the bats are dehydrating to death. Um, there could be immune suppression factors. Um, really, we're just not sure why the bats are actually dying from the fungus. But it's very clearly associated with this fu fungus, Pseudogenascus destructans. Where did they pick up the fungus? From other bats? So it's, it's spread by, certainly by the bats themselves. Um, it was likely, let me move on to the next slide. It was likely uh, spread by cavers. Um, and so if you sort of look at this, you'll see a big jump from, this is the epicenter in Albany, New York. Um, and the purple is the, the second year after it was discovered. And you see a big jump down here uh, to, I think that's Center County, Pennsylvania which is where Penn State is. It's, there's a big caving community there. And then down here to Blacksburg, Virginia, where Virginia Tech is, there's also a big com caving community there. So we see these big jumps associated with big caving communities, almost certainly spread by cavers. And then you sort of see this radiating effect out. This map is actually out of date by one day. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, it was announced that Minnesota was confirmed. So these blocks are suspect. Um, it has now been confirmed in Minnesota as well. Um, so it's found now in, in 28 states in five Canadian provinces, and that's 10 years after it was first discovered. In my opinion, it's the number one conservation emergency in the world. So this is a little bit of a sad picture, but this is Pennsylvania bat biologist Greg Turner holding dozens of dead bats outside of a cave in Pennsylvania. Um, you want to bring a, a group of usually pretty hard bat biologists and make them cry, put them in a situation like this. It's very disheartening. So the impacts of the disease 10 years after it was first discovered are dire. Estimates of mortality are incredibly high um, and are estimated at 99% for the little brown bat, 94% for the northern long-eared bat, and this is based off of those um, hibernacula surveys that I was talking about, which is really sort of our best estimate. Uh, we have corroborated this with summer survey data. This is um, misnetting data, like people like me going out and capturing bats. Um, and that's showing a 93 to 98% decline in Pennsylvania. Those are Pennsylvania figures. West Virginia is similar, 97% uh, for the Little Brown. 84 for the Indiana. Um, and interestingly, only about 50 cents, 56% for the Northern. Um, this just could be a result of survey bias, or it could be um, maybe the caves in West Virginia are, deg are degree or cool, uh, to warmer. Um, the fungus is a cold-loving fungus, so it really likes those cold caves. Maybe it's just inhibiting the fungus enough that a little bit more bats are surviving. I'm not really sure why, what accounts for this, this uh, lower decline, but 56% is still, still really significant. So are we seeing this in the tree bats as well? 
No. So white nose syndrome is only found in, uh, in cave bats. However, wind farms are impacting the tree bats. Um, so I was talking about how the tree bats tend to forage along forested ridge tops. Well, that's where most of our wind farms are also found. Um, they, bats are found, a, are killed by wind turbines um, quite significantly more than birds. Uh, and there's likely a few factors for that. Um, one, bats are very curious. Uh, so a bat's, you know, coming down its migratory pathway that it does every year, and all of a sudden there's these big trees in the, on, you know, the, in the distance, and it wants to go figure out what, you know, awesome roost trees these are. And um, interestingly enough, the cause of mortality is actually in debate for these, um, why bats actually die from the wind turbines. It, they die in so, so often or so more frequently than birds. It, we don't believe it's just strikes, direct strikes with the blades. You find lots of bats dead under turbines that have no evidence of being hit by a blade. Um, and one of the theories that has gone around for a long time is that it's barrow trauma. So there's a pressure gradient between the front and the back of the blades. And as they pass through it, um, basically their lungs explode. Um, this happens certainly in some cases. Uh, but necropsies of the bats found um, don't always show this lung explosion. So it could be explained by air embolisms as well, similar to the bends with, that divers get when they come up too quickly. Um, gas bubbles form in your blood and cause you know, awful things to happen. Um, so I'm not sure why it doesn't happen to birds, uh, but it doesn't appear that it's the same mechanism because we find a lot more dead bats than we do birds. So wind farm mortality is estimated to be between 21 and 70 bats per turbine per year in the eastern United States. Um, and if we extrapolate um, this, this figure to the estimated number of wind turbines that will be on the landscape by the year 2020, this is probably going to be between 33 and 111,000 bats killed per year if something doesn't change. But the good news is, is that something is changing. Um, this is just a generic map showing where the wind farms are in Pennsylvania. Uh, but the wind energy community is really quite aware of this problem. I would, you know, most people consider wind developers to be pretty uh, environmentally friendly. They really want the good PR. They, you know, they're trying. Um, and we've had some really good success, actually, um, by changing some just very slight things. So. Bats that you see spinning aren't always producing energy. Basically, if the wind speed's low enough, they'll disengage the generator, um, and the blade will just spin freely. Uh, if they were to engage the generator, it's likely not fast enough to actually produce energy. Um, and what we've asked the wind operators to do is simply turn the blades out of the wind if they're not producing energy. And that stops the blades from spinning. And this is shown to be extremely effective at reducing uh, bat mortality. Also by increasing what's known as the cut-in speed, so this is the speed that they actually start producing energy, by just raising that up a few meters per second where bats aren't present. So if a high wind speed, bats aren't going to be present. It's too windy up there. They're going to come down. Um, we've shown between a 44 and a 93% uh, reduction in mortality with less than 1% loss in energy production. So that's the sort of solutions that I love. That really gets me going, you know. It didn't really hurt the energy companies and we're saving a lot of species. Additionally, there's other technologies that are being developed. Um, there's deterrence, uh, ultrasonic deterrence, um, basically just making a lot of noise to try to keep the bats away. This is shown to be effective, but it's, a, it's kind of an engineering problem. It's difficult to get the bubble where you want it and really protect a, you know, a wind farm that might be couple hundred miles in length. Uh, it's, it's kind of an engineering problem at the moment. Um, and additional technologies are in development as well, changing the, the design of the wind turbines. Um, basically, there was a physicist that did a study, and I wish I would have, I wish I could recall the exact figure, but I think it was about 25% chance that the bat detects the blades as it's approaching. Um, so about 75% the bat doesn't even really know that it's crossing through that blade plane. Um, and what that, that scientist did is he developed, um, I think it was a six wind turbine blade, but that actually had two, two planes of blades that spun in opposite directions. And it detected the, the um, blades about 99% um, in that design. So hopefully there will be um, 
better improvements in turbine technology that will really make this a non-issue. So in Pennsylvania, we have three endangered species. Um, and they're protected at both the federal and the state level. So uh, a species, if it's listed on the endangered species, uh, the Federal Endangered Species Act, and it's present in the state, is by default included in the state. Um, and so we have the Indiana bat, which is federally endangered. It's the only federally endangered mammal that we have in Pennsylvania. Uh, we have the northern long-eared bat, which was recently listed as federally threatened. And we have the small-footed bat, which is listed as Pennsylvania threatened. So it's not federally listed, but it's listed on our State Endangered Species Act. What's the distinction between endangered and threatened? So endangered species have much more protection uh, than threatened species. So endangered species are species that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife has determined are critically in peril. They, you, you know, something must be done to save the species. Um, Threatened species, uh, it's basically just a grade below endangered species. And this actually has some pretty real ramifications, uh, which we'll talk about in a second with how the northern bat was listed. Um, and so there's two agencies that regulate endangered species in Pennsylvania. You have the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Pennsylvania Game Commission. That's why there's some other, if you're not talking about bats, Pennsylvania Boat Commission um, as well but they're not involved in bats. Um, and under the endangered species legislation, it's illegal to take or harm endangered species, and this is often extended to their habitat. Um, so for a federal project, or a project that's involving a federal agency, this could be anything like a pipeline that's regulated by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, um, or a you know, a forest, uh, say the state forest wants to do a timber harvest, um, that's, that's covered under this as well. Um, they're, they're prohibited from, from harming the species. So that means they're not allowed to take that species habitat um, without showing that it won't cause significant harm to the species. Um, and similarly for non-federal or non-government projects, they're not allowed to take individuals. So you're not allowed to go into a bat cave and kill Indiana bats, or you're going to get quite a hefty fine and maybe some jail time. Um, and to determine these impacts, biologists like myself are hired to go out and to survey before um, any sort of development happens and see, are there endangered species located in the area? If so, what are they doing? And how will they be impacted by this, this project? And we use a variety of uh, methods to do this. We use the mist netting, which you saw in the introductory photo. Um, we use these acoustic detectors, which pick up the echolocation calls of the bats as they fly by. Um, when we catch an endangered species, we'll glue little radio transmitters to it and follow it back to its roost tree. Um, we can also follow it around at night to determine where exactly it's foraging. Um, I often call this kind of a scavenger hunt. It's really fun to track a bat to the tree that it's living in and sit there and watch 20 bats fly out of that tree. Um, that's to me, is really awesome. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I've, I've, I've tracked a um, small-footed bat to a pile of rocks, and you know, you're sitting there thinking, there's no way there's bats in there and you're sitting there waiting and 30 bats fly out of this little tiny crack in a rock. It's really amazing. So the most recent addition to the endangered species legislation is the northern long-eared bat. Uh, and the final listing was finalized this year. And the U.S. Fish and Wildlife chose to enact what's called the subsection 4D of the Endangered Species Act. And this is only applicable to threatened species. It's not applicable to endangered species. And it allows the service a lot more discretion in the types of activities that are covered under, under the Act. And the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service um, took a couple years to really investigate um, whether or not these bats should be listed and looked at the factors causing their decline. And what they determined is that because declines were caused by white-nose syndrome and not other activities, the most important conservation action was to protect the hibernacula in the maternity colonies.
So the final 40 ruling broke the, the range of the northern long-eared bat into two zones, within the white-nose zone and within out the white-nose zone. Um, the orange and red areas here are the white-nose zone, and then the green is the range of the Indiana bats, or I'm sorry, the northern long-eared bat. So the Dakotas, they don't have to worry about any, any protection of the species. They're outside of the white-nose zone. Incidental take is not prohibited under the 4D uh, ruling. However, if you're in, within the white-nose zone, which is really the majority of the range, there are some specific actions that are prohibited. So you're not allowed to go into a hibernacula and kill northern long eared bats. Um, you're not allowed to alter the hibernacula in such a way that will impact uh, northern long eared bats. So say you have a cave on your property and it has or had northern long eared bats in it, you're not allowed to go closing that cave. Um, there's some other measures that you could take if you wanted to protect it, but you're not allowed to alter it in such a way that will prevent northerns from using it. You're not allowed to remove trees within a quarter mile of a known hibernacula. And this is known as the spring and fall staging area. So the bats spend a couple weeks before and after hibernation just sort of getting ready to make their, their migration to their summer range. Um, and this is really important habitat immediately surrounding the hibernacula. You're not allowed to cut down a known occupied maternity colony. And you're not allowed to remove trees within 150 feet around a known um, colony during the pupping season. So when the pups are um, being born and are first becoming volant, first going out and flying on their own, um, you're not allowed to remove those trees during that time. And those are live trees as well as dead trees? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. Yep. So far, we believe that's the case. Um, that's actually a really important question, uh, how long the fungus is persistent in the substrate. Um, we don't know the answer to that yet, but it's likely a long time. Um, so we'll talk about managing hibernacula here in a little bit and touch on that a little bit more. So the decline of biodiversity across the globe uh, has, is really a central concern in the field of conservation biology. And to combat this loss of biodiversity, many scientists and public land managers have implemented what's known as an ecosystem management approach. Um, and really what this says is that if you protect your native species, this will in turn protect your native ecosystems. So, so far we've discussed bats and their declines, um, and now let's focus on how they fit into the watersheds and the implications of the decline of bats. So what exactly is a watershed? This, has, this is poor watershed management. <laughs> so a watershed is an ecosystem within a common drainage area with complex interactions between biotic and abiotic factors. This includes plants, animals, water, soil, buildings, people, and bats. Every bat on Earth lives in a watershed, and with some rare exceptions, every watershed on Earth has bats. Despite bats being a keystone species in many watershed ecosystems, are rarely included in this in the dialogue of watershed protection. So the relationship between predator and prey is probably or arguably the most important relationship in the survival of a species. Unhealthy watersheds likely have low insect diversity and abundance, which has a direct impact on bats. Um, so when you, when you have a hatch on a river, um, such as a mayfly hatch, uh, you'll, you'll often catch a lot of bats. So I've worked sites before where the first night you go out on a pond, you think, oh yeah, we're gonna catch lots of bats here. You don't catch anything. You come back the next night, there's lots of really annoying insects around your face, and you catch lots of bats. Um, they're really, really dependent on this insect activity. And so whatever you can do to promote insect diversity and abundance is gonna have a direct impact on bats. Similarly, habitat availability is important. Um, this is particularly uh, important in areas that have 
low um, roost availability. So if you have lots of agricultural lands, lots of urban areas, then you're going to want to worry a little bit more about the roosting potential. Um, maybe you install bat boxes. Um, there's this really unique uh, thing called Braden bark now that goes on telephone poles. It's artificial roost that they just wrap around tele telephone poles. Um, and winter hibernacula as well. So if you have caves and mines in your, in your area, it's really important to protect these habitats. Um, the accumulation of toxins. So if there's a, lot, a large toxin load uh, in the watershed, this could have direct impacts on bats. We haven't really seen any evidence of this yet. But bats have a lot of brown adipose tissue, which is where toxins tend to accumulate. Um, so, and this is, this is because of uh, their hibernation requirements. It sort of releases energy a little bit slower. Um, and when bats are eating insects uh, that have maybe been sprayed with fertilizer or with pesticides, um, it could have an impact of bats. Maybe it's lowering immune systems. We don't really know the, the implications of this yet. <clears throat> the reduction of the number of bats and diversity in the landscape will likely have far-reaching implications. But what seems to resonate with most people is this dollar figure right here. So that's $3.7 billion per year. That's the estimated economic impact of bats in the United States to farmers alone. So if you were to remove all of the bats in the United States, that's the estimated cost that would have cost per year because of the um, increased pesticide application and crop damage that would result. That's a lot of money. <laughs> um, and so this is that same study uh, applied to Pennsylvania. Um, and <coughs> you can see that uh, in um, Chester County, uh, it's estimated to be between six and $8.4 million annually. And in Berks County, it's estimated to be $11.5 million annually. Um, that's a, again, that's just a lot of, a lot of money um, for something that people aren't talking about. We have lost almost 99% of some of these species, um, and it's, it's likely to have really significant ramifications. So we have seen um, how bats, or how watershed health will impact bats. Well, what about the loss of bats? How will that impact the watersheds? Uh, really, it comes back again to this insect abundance and diversity. You have a lot less bats out there consuming insects. This is almost certainly going to change the insect composition um, in, your, in your watersheds. This is bound to have an economic impact, as we just saw, uh, because of increased pesticide applications um, and uh, agricultural pests, um, but also forest diseases. Uh, you have the gypsy moth on the landscape. You have the hemlock woolly adelge on the landscape. Um, and bats are consuming these pests. If we have less bats, uh, then we're going to have more of these forest diseases. And this is going to have an economic impact. Um, but really, it's the unknown that we're, we're concerned about. What is going to be the fall down effect of having uh, a reduction in these keystone species? We don't really know how the ecosystems are going to respond. Um, I was listening to an NPR our, our, um, news story on the way in today, and they were talking about the Zika virus. Um, bats consume in, uh, mosquitoes. And so there's potentially a human health impact here as well. Um, you know, West Nile virus. Um, and who knows what will show up in the future. So what can we do? Well, public awareness is arguably the most effective conservation measure. Um, think Coca-Cola and the, the polar bears and World Wildlife Fund and the pandas. Um, but unfortunately, what those species have is uh, charisma. Um, and bats don't... <laughs> People don't generally think of bats being charismatic. I would argue otherwise. Um, <laughs> so we're all in a position to help, uh, help educate others about bats. Whether it's your friends or neighbors or maybe your kindergarten teacher, or everyone can, can spread the word that bats are in peril and we need to help. Um, Money is always welcome. <laughs> um, there's a few organization websites here which will gladly accept your money. Um, time donations. So currently there's a uh, program in the works uh, called NA Bats, um, and it's modeled after the North, North American Amphibian Monitoring Program. Some of you might be familiar with that program. 
it uses citizen scientists to go out and collect a large amount of data um, for free that allows for really pretty good monitoring um, over a very large scale area. Uh, so the North American Amphibian, Amphibian Monitoring Program was implemented after um, some declines of amphibians, um, and it has, it's been really successful. Um, there are a lot, a lot of states, uh, maybe every state is participating in it. Uh, so we're sort of trying to model um, our program after that. And it's utilizing those acoustic detectors that I was talking about and putting those on top of your car and driving transects and um, recording bad activity that way. And the goal is to do that the same way over a long period of time so we can sort of track our trends and species. So moving on to some more uh, specific best management practices. Um, say you have a small pond or um, maybe just a lawn um, in your yard. These are some things that you can do to help promote bats. Really what this all comes back to is promoting insect diversity and abundance. So develop species rich grasslands. Um, lawns are awful. <laughs> they really are. Um, if you could let a portion of your lawn grow up and um, that will promote insect diversity and you're likely to get more bats in your, in your yard because of that. Um, avoid fertilizers and pesticides. Avoid cutting until plants have gone to seed. This just allows the more plants to, to propagate. Maintain or restate flooding. Um, unfortunately, this sort of doesn't help the mosquito aspect of things, but it does, mosquitoes will help the bats. So um, really creating diversity in your uh, ecosystem. So if you're managing a river, um, you want to have, say, sloped banks so that uh, it promotes insect diversity. All these sort of little things to help um, increase the number and in species of insects in the landscape. Um, and install bat boxes. So if you live in a, in a high agriculture area where there's not a lot of trees, uh, install some bat boxes on your land, uh, in your yard. Um, don't be disheartened if bats don't occupy them immediately. It sometimes takes a few years for them to be colonized. Sometimes they're never colonized. But if there's bats in the area and they need a roost, then you'll certainly uh, you'll see them uh, get occupied. Yeah, so you, they want, you want solar exposure. Um, and so e even the natural roofs that we find bats in tend to be in gaps in the canopy where they get a lot of solar exposure. Mm -hmm. The bats like to be warm because then they can, they actually go into torpor, which is a sort of pseudo hibernation state in the, in the summertime. So if it's warm enough, they'll, they'll drop their metabolism down so that they're, they don't have to produce that energy themselves. So yeah, they definitely like warmer environments. Um, for that reason. Yep. So have we ever seen the white note syndrome in a bat, bat box? So typically they're not hibernating in the bat boxes. Um, they're moving into hibernacula. Um, and in the southern United States where they would be in a bat box all year round, we don't see white nose syndrome. So I don't think it's likely. Um, there probably is. There's probably spores just from them being out and about. You know, the bats carry the spores on them. Um, so it's likely that if a clean bat went into a, a bat box that was contaminated that it could catch. Um, Is there a certain temperature that white notes come to that's that? It's definitely a cold loving fungus. Um, so it's really only growing and putting out the, the, the mycelia at the lower temperatures. But spores are very, very hardy. Um, spores are, it's really hard to, to kill uh, fungus spores. So this, uh, the keynote this afternoon was about the Schuylkill River, um, and it, it touched on some, some of the sedimentation and acid mine drainage issues uh, that um, impacted that, that river. Um, and this probably had really significant implications on the bats. Uh, I had mentioned that small-footed bats are really common in this watershed, um, and they're listed as threatened because they aren't doing as well as they should be doing. Um, and potentially, the health of that river might have had a, a significant impact or you know, reasoning for that. Um, so really what I'm trying to show is the direct correlation between the health of the watershed and the health of the bats. Um, and bats can help make the watershed healthy and healthy watersheds can help promote bats. Um, so, oops, sorry. <laughs> 
So this is a, um, a this was a study that looked at wastewater treatment plants and the effect of the discharge on bats. And they found a significant difference between upstream and downstream of this wastewater treatment plant, likely because of insect diversity. So insect diversity was lower downstream than it was upstream, and therefore you have more bats upstream. So as indicated by the US Fish and Wildlife Service, managing hibernacula is one of the most important conservation measures. Uh, and there's a variety of ways to do this, and this is one of them. So this is actually an old rail tunnel. This isn't a, a natural bat hibernacula. Um, this is in Pennsylvania. Um, I helped build that. Each one of those bars weighs 250 pounds, and me and another guy lifted all those in, by hand. Um, <laughs> so the Pennsylvania Game Commission was trying to create an artificial hibernacula at this location, um, just trying to promote more habitat availability. Um, so if you have... Um, a, a cave um, and you're having disturbance uh, in that cave or mine, maybe you want to consider putting in a bat gate. Some other measures that you can do um, is the Pennsylvania Game Commission has started installing these cameras on the exterior or on the outside of uh, really important hibernacula that automatically send a picture um, to uh, Game Commission officers. And they've, they've made a couple of rests, I believe, uh, from this. Uh, so people are messing around in areas they shouldn't be, automatically get a picture on your phone, um, and you can quickly take action. So that seemed to be working pretty well. Do people actually go into the to kill bats? Not to kill bats. Um, well, maybe. Uh, <laughs> but generally, it's just, uh, oh, this is cool. Let's try to go in here. And um, other issues are, you know, it's amazing how many caves and mines I've gone up to, and there's been bonfire, evidence of bonfires right at the entrances. And generally, when you go up during the day, the air, depending on which entrance you're at, but generally the air is blowing out. Well, at night, it reverses and it gets sucked in. So if you're having a bonfire at night, all that smoke's going to get sucked right into that hypernacula and probably really disturb those bats. So this is what's known as an ACCA cave conser or bat conservation gate. It's very specifically designed with bats in mind. Um, most importantly is the managing of this temperature and the humidity. So allowing, not changing the airflow in and out of the cave. Um, they used to use uh, anything from wire mesh to uh, old jail sails, anything. And so some physicists were involved in the, the design of this gate to make sure that it didn't impede airflow and that it didn't impede bats coming back and forth. So the measurements and the distances, those are all very specific to allow um, bats to continue to utilize. However, like you mentioned, caves are, uh, cave gates aren't without their drawbacks. And so you really want to consider um, some things before you decide to gate. Um, so are cultural or natural resources present? Um, if they're, they're not, then there's no reason to install a back gate. Um, if there are, is the site being threatened? So are you having people going in and out of the hibernacula? Um, if you are, then you... Are there other alternatives to keep people out? Can you put up signs? Can you build a fence? Um, there's a really awesome fence uh, up in the Wilkes Bar area that looks like a Jurassic Park fence um, that they built to keep people out. Um, it's amazing what people will do to get into fences in, in these gates. Um, they've been these back gates have been blown off with dynamite. Uh, <laughs> they've been cut with reciprocal saws. Um, each one of those bars. So those bars are one and a half inch steel with half-inch angle iron stuck up in them to prevent them from being spread. And sometimes you'll put greased round bar in between that so that when you hit it with a reciprocal saw, it just spins. So we really have engineered the heck out of those things to keep people out. Um, and lastly, will the gate cause significant harm? So you have to think about things like airflow. You have to think about things like the bats coming in and out of the cave. Um, if you have a hole in the ground, you don't want to just put a cap over the top of it because the bats aren't going to be able to get it in and out. What we do is we put big boxes so the bat can come up, fly around, get its bearings, and then leave. So in conclusion, the, bat, the best way to protect bats is to protect their prey, their roost, and to prevent disturbances in hibernacula. Bats are in decline across the globe. However, nowhere is it more dire than right here in Pennsylvania. White Nose has created what yet might be a mass extinction event of over half of our species. 
Wind farms are impacting the other half, causing precipitous declines. So who should care about bats? You should. This is a, um, a screech owl that I caught in Ohio. So we often catch uh, other things when we're out uh, nest netting bats. And this is one of the cooler ones. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you for allowing me to spend this time with you this afternoon and explain why bats are important and why you should care and why they are an integral part of our watershed ecosystems. I believe we have a few minutes for questions. In your opinion, have we turned the corner on the white dome syndrome? I think we have potentially plateaued on the declines. Um, we're seeing about between the 1% and 5% survivors. Um, I, I think it's yet to be determined if those survivors are surviving year after year. Um, and if they are passing whatever immunity they might have to their offspring. That's called the golden bat theory. Hopefully there's some bats out there with immunity. Uh, there was recently a study published in China that showed that there is white-nose syndrome in China and that those bats have developed immunity to it. Um, now, whether or not they co-evolved with that fungus, I am not sure. But cross your fingers that there's some immunity out there in the population. Well, in Upper Bucks County, they see a resurgence in the bat population. Not, not a great resurgence, but uh, a noticeable. OK. Has, has there been any work on uh, a historical population, like pre-mine, pre-European colonization, and post? It seems like there's many more potential um, caves now with all the Sure, yeah, I, I definitely think that mining helps bats um, and, and even quarries with the small footed bats. Um, I, I tell my quarry clients that if it weren't for you, the bats wouldn't be here in the first place because it's true. They're opening up that habitat for the bats. Um, and yeah, certainly those abandoned mines. Um, as far as numbers, I'm not really sure. I'm going to guess it was about the same just because you could have these huge colonies that didn't have the impacts of humans going in and disturbing them. Um, we do have a, you can look at that to a limited extent based on guanu depositions in the caves. Um, that's how we know that sometimes, our, we believe that the uh, Indiana bats were historically in the millions in the caves, um, just based on those deposits. I heard a rumor or a hypothesis at one point that the white nose has been around a lot longer than we think, and that the bat populations are being made more susceptible, being weakened. I've heard a whole bunch of other things. Have you heard anything about that, pesticides, whatever? Yeah, you know, it's, it's possible. Um, though I think given the, the, rap, the rapid spread after it was discovered, you know, it was discovered in 2006, and then two years later we're seeing it here, and then 10 years later we're seeing it at 28 states and five providences. I think if it was around, um, you wouldn't see that sort of large scale. You know, it's not likely that pesticide application is going to be the same in Canada as it is down in the southern United States. Um, and we're seeing sort of the impact that it is similar. Um, they, the, the, the fungus is known to be in Europe. Um, it's all over Europe. Um, and there was a caving convention in Albany, New York, about the time that the fungus came in. So. <laughs> Oops, we did it again. <laughs> wow, things have, you know, number of Sure, yeah, and you know, that's what I was talking about with the accumulation of toxins. It could have implications that we don't even understand yet, yeah. I am showing 245, so. <laughs> Thank you.